Breaking, U.S. Navy unveils insane new weapon, North Korea crapping their pants. President Trump pledged to make America great again. On the campaign trail he promised when it came to our military, he would rebuild it and return it to one of the finest. Trump promised he would increase the size of our troops, adding 350,000 soldiers to our U.S. Army and adding 10-15 battalions to the U.S. Marine Corps. He also said he would add 1,200 fighter aircraft to the U.S. Air Force, as well as, 350 surface ships and submarines to our U.S. Navy. It looks like President Trump is keeping those promises as he begins to rebuild our depleted military into one of the most elite ever in history. In January, President Trump signed an executive order to launch the great rebuilding of the armed forces which will include new ships, planes, weapons and the modernization of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Our new military under President Trump, well, let's just say it's going to be big league. President Trump is ensuring that military leaders have the support they need to accelerate the campaign against the Islamic State and to build combat readiness now and for the future. North Korea punk cast leader Kim Jong-un may need a change of underwear after getting a look at this gem being put on the fast track by the Trump administration. ISIS acting up? Boom. Syria? Boom. Kim Jong-un? Boom. Yeah dot dot depends. Just saying. Depends. Just saying. As America's first all-new carrier design since the Nimitz in 1976, the Ford class will serve into at least into the 2070s. But many of their escorts will be late model Arleigh Burke class destroyers, so-called Flight 3 updates of a 1980s design whose first ship, DDG-51, was commissioned in 1991. That's why the Navy is brainstorming a next-generation future surface combatant, aiming to solicit design proposals from industry around 2020. DDG is a great class of ship. But we're never going to build Flight 4, we need to move on, Moore said. It's probably time for us to work from a clean sheet. Moore is on a steering committee for the clean sheet future surface combatant, along with three-star counterparts from the Navy staff, UPNOV, and the operational fleet. The idea is to have warfighters, shipbuilders, and budgeteers working together from the start, instead of one group coming up with unrealistic requirements for a super ship the others can't build or can't afford. What does this mean for our enemies? The great thing about electrical power, unlike such features as 16-inch guns or thick armor plate, is that you can use it for almost anything, if one weapon, sensor, or communications system becomes obsolete, just unplug it and plug in something new. At least, that's the Navy's vision of never-ending modernization. But to upgrade without undue agony, you need to design a ship from the keel up with room to grow and an open architecture into which new components can easily plug and play. That's not how traditional ships like the Arleigh Burke destroyer were designed, which is part of the reason Flight 3 will probably be the last major upgrade of the class. We're cramming a lot of stuff in that ship, said Moore. With the future surface combatant, by contrast, the Navy doesn't just want to build a ship, but a floating framework that can keep evolving for decades to exploit new technologies and meet new threats. That's not easy. As much as Moore wants to accelerate, the ship is going to be out there for the next 40, 50, 60 years, so it's important that we don't take any shortcuts, he emphasized. It's very important that we do diligence on looking at alternatives, looking at the cost, marrying the requirements up to the costs, so at the end we all have an understanding of this is the capability I'm going to buy, this is how much it's going to cost, this is when I'm going to get the capability, this is how long it'll last. If we have that discussion up front with the future surface combatant, we'll avoid some of the typical growing pains that we have for some of these programs. In other words, no more screwing around, bowing to dictators dedicated to wiping us out, smiling to our faces and funding terrorism behind our backs. No more phony red lines, flexibility on hot mix, reset buttons, Arab Springs, or any other nonsense. Just strength in what comes with it, peace. Share this if you think Kim Jong-un can kiss your ass, your ass, oh my god. Trump walked up behind this Marine and did something no one would have expected. 
President Donald Trump and Melania met with President Mauricio Macri and his wife Juliana Iwata at the White House on Thursday. He welcomed the two Argentine guests and Trump then did the unexpected. Watch the magic happen at the 150 mark. Trump leaned in to hug Melania and then patted the Marine on the back. Don't you just love our President Trump? The Trump administration has now postponed Barack Obama lifting a 16-year ban on imports of Argentine lemons. Trump responded, We're going to be great friends, better than ever before. Melania Trump looked so beautiful in her military green dress. This is why we love Donald Trump. He makes our military men and women feel like they have a president that cares. It's the little things, little things, just in, Australia makes massive move against Muslims. Trump was right. The left here in the United States tries to shout anyone down who wants to vet who we bring into this country. We are sick of it, and apparently so is Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. In a shocking, but pleasing, twist Turnbull recently buckled down on the way you get your citizenship in Australia. The key point is you need to show that your values reflect the values that the Australian people hold dear. According to SBS News, there will be overall tighter requirements for new applicants, especially for Muslims suspected of following Sharia law. One of the first steps you need to take to make it into the country is to pass a tougher citizenship test. The test originally had 20 questions, now there are going to be more questions added to the test. They are going to be include reading, writing, listening, and moral components. Turnbull said that he is doing this in an attempt to not just strengthen the multicultural aspect of Australia, but to also strengthen the values that they hold as a country. He went on to say that he would never ask potential citizens to abandon their heritage or their culture or their background but they need to understand how people treat one another in Australia. They will not settle for people who are okay with domestic violence or hold radical beliefs. It is also going to be required that the person interested has a four-year permanent residence in Australia. They cannot just show up, claim they want to live there, and that is the end of it. In other words, they have standards. If a potential applicant takes the test and fails it twice, they are going to have to wait another two years before they try again. When they fail a citizenship test, obviously there is something that qualifies them as not being able to function within a normal healthy society. The Democrats of our country could stand to learn a thing or two from Turnbull's move. In our country, the left embrace dangerous ideology. We have people in our streets shouting that we need to follow Sharia law. When we try to stand up to the people in our country who want to bring dangerous refugees here we are called racists, bigots, Islamophobes, and so on and so forth. But Australia has set a new standard that we should look at very carefully. There is a lot that we can learn from their new setup. We are just waiting for the left to start yelling that the entire country of Australia is racist. It would not surprise us if the left tried to take this approach. They have already shown that they will actively attack anyone who thinks differently than they do. A message is being sent through the world that we are not going to settle for this irrational behavior, and that we are no longer willing to let refugees come here unchecked. Our guess is. The crime rate in Australia is going to drop immensely due to this move. They are going to end up happier, safer, and better off than they were before thanks to this new stricter system. We need to adopt something similar as soon as possible. Do you think President Trump is going to follow Turnbull's lead? Please share this story on Facebook and let us know because we want to hear your voice. Your voice. Breaking, civil war about to erupt after what just happened in Sanctuary City. Every policy that President Donald Trump tries to implement for Americans' safety, is not only met with a great deal of resistance from the left but also from defiant judges who block his progress. We saw this several times with Trump's travel ban from terrorist-tied countries and now we're seeing it with regards to so-called sanctuary cities. Judges are disguising their clear liberal bias as judicial rulings and now tensions over this illegal immigrant issue have put America at the breaking point, edging on a civil war. On Tuesday, federal judge William Ork III blocked President Trump's executive order he just signed, which would prevent federal funding from going to sanctuary cities to help illegals. 
As soon as he heard the good weren't going to go to several cities in his liberal state, he took immediate action that was within his power, much to the delight of liberals who were counting on him to disrespect our leader's orders. Oric, of the Northern District of California, issued an injunction against the Trump administration after the city of San Francisco and county of Santa Clara sued over the president's plan to withhold federal funds from municipalities that harbor illegal immigrants, Fox News Insider reported. The block was made on the claim that Trump's order was too broad and would affect other parts of government reliant on the funds, outside of assistance for illegals. Trump isn't one to accept defeat or sit back and allow liberals to walk all over him. Addressing the defiant move as more than just sticking to party lines but putting people in danger, White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer released the following statement, adding fuel to the issue. San Francisco, and cities like it, are putting the well-being of criminal aliens before the safety of our citizens, and those city officials who authorize these policies have the blood of dead Americans on their hands. Adding to that sentiment, Spicer also called this ruling what it truly is a gift to drug cartels and street gangs. However, the reverse of this executive order and the numerous blocks of others that came before it is far worse than just usurping our president's decisions and appeasing your party. Fox News Perfectly Blunt show host, Tucker Carlson.